welcome from my side to the workshop on lifelong learning in the age of digital transformation, chances and challenges for institutions of higher education. My name is Ratnish Tiwari and I work as a senior research fellow at uh, the Hamburg University of Technology and am also a professor for business administration and global innovation at Hochschule Fresenius University of Applied Sciences in, in Hamburg. So that is uh, briefly about myself before we proceed, just a small um, information. This event is being recorded and I think it's planned, Anna, right? That we will be publishing the, the workshop proceedings on YouTube. Exactly, thank you. Yeah, so, so it's for your information. And since we are only, yeah, a small group and we want to make use of this opportunity for discussion. I would like to request all of you to introduce yourself briefly with your name, the institution that you are representing and maybe the function that you are having. And so that afterwards, when we also have our speakers, then we would be having an opportunity for maybe a bit more uh, in-depth discussions. So, um, but before I do that, let me first um, say, uh, before I forget, um, we are very happy and we are very grateful for having here three speakers who would be sharing their insights um, as a part of today's workshop. All three of them have a connection to our vision project, either as a key influencer or as a, and or as interview partners and or as uh, having provided material for a case study that we are going to publish. So all the speakers, they have a connection to the project and I welcome Dr. Arvind Chinchode from India who would be making a presentation here. Arvind, thank you very much. And uh, uh, you are very uh, welcome here. We look forward to listening to you. The same is true for Professor Hendrik Miller who is Vice Dean for academic teaching at uh, the Hochschule Fresenius in Hamburg and uh, has an innovative teaching format called the mixed mode here, which he will introduce. And finally, my colleague Louisa Dagan from the Hamburg University of Technology, who has done research on blended learning and is uh, bringing multiple perspectives on this as a student, as a research associate, and um, as someone who has also worked in the industry on, on these formats. So welcome to all three of you. And now my request to, to you maybe to, to introduce yourself briefly. And um, maybe I'll, I'll begin, I, I would request just to keep it efficient, maybe um, Anna, maybe you can begin and I'll go on saying the names. Uh, uh... I will just say hello from Emory University that is the coordinator of the vision project and we are very happy, but I'm also sad because project is ending. Uh, let here we have also Michele from Tetos. He's waving to you. <laughs> you, don't, you don't see him. He's muted. I think that we also have Professor uh, Dr. Kiriaki with here. Uh, Today, then is Anna Bethens from ISPIM, Irina, Steve Hartman from the Gruter. Let's wave us. <laughs> Say hi. Uh, and uh, if others participants want to say, I think they can say a word about themselves. So maybe like we can simply give them words so that you don't have to look for, for them among the, uh, among the participants. All right, so um, maybe uh, we can proceed after you, Anna, with Stefan. Yeah, hello, wait, am I muted? No, I'm not. Uh, Stefan Buse, I'm the Deputy Director of the Institute for Technology Innovation Management at Hamburg University, so a colleague of Raj Nish, as well as Stefan Bergmann and Luisa Degen. Um, I know some of you, most of you, and um, so as a lecturer, as well as a program coordinator for an international joint master program, I'm 
very much engaged in developing new concepts um, with regard to, to education and blended learning and all that stuff. This is why I'm very much interested in it. Glad to be here. Thank you, Katarina. Hello, I'm Katharina Glugarakis. I also work at the Technical University of Hamburg. Um, right now, I'm part of a joint uh, EXIST project um, to support uh, entrepreneurship from um, seven universities or higher education institutions in the metropolitan region Hamburg. And I'm um, responsible to develop a um, certificate program interdisciplinary um, innovation and entrepreneurship, and therefore I'm also interested in digital um, education, and I'm uh, also a former colleague of um, Raj. Yes, thank you, Katharina. Steve? Yeah, hello. Um, I'm Steve Hartman from De Gruyter Publishers. We, um, I'm representing De Gruyter on the Vision Research team, so we're a publishing partner on this team. We're going to be publishing an open access book early in 22, um, 2022, which will be reflecting the outcomes of the, the Vision Research Project. And we're also planning to publish um, later in 2022 a playbook, a business playbook, which will be um, taking a slightly different take on the project, um, developing some of the personas that have come out in the research. So there will be two books published as a result of the research, and I'm very pleased to be a member of the team. Thank you, Steve. Mikkel. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Michele, I'm an entrepreneur and co-founder of the startup uh, Perceptos. Uh, we are also part of the Vision Project and um, our startup is about uh, the digital transformation of workshops, so of online meetings, so to say. And uh, yeah, so as an as important part also uh, in education, um, this kind of uh, meetings and exchange uh, is, is for us very important and yeah it was also a pleasure to to work with my colleagues in the vision project thank you Michele. Yolanda yes hello all uh, I'm Yolanda Zeeman I'm a trainer at the technical university in Eindhoven and I came across this project of vision and I thought I'd like to know more about it so <laughs> just let me hear and uh, I'd like to think with you, reflect with you. But I, I'm not so very experienced in this field yet. Thank you very much, Yolanda. Irina. <clears throat> Hello from my side. It takes a while to unmute. Uh, <laughs> sorry for delay. Um, even the Fingerbaum, I'm from Tiff's North, I'm part of Vision Project as well. Um, my role in the company is, uh, well, I'm a senior manager for innovation and digitalization. So and in the vision project, we're responsible for a quality and evaluation part. Uh, but at the same time, since the innovation digitalization are uh, very close to my heart, um, I'm very much involved in the um, developing of internal uh, training problems and collaboration, potential collaboration with universities on that, on those topics. Uh, so it was really great to get to see the results and to be able to follow up on the results of the project and accompany them. Thank you, Irina. Now, uh, Julia and uh, Mary the questions uh, for those introducing uh, themselves to, to turn on their cameras. Yes. Thank you, Julia. I will start. Yeah, please. Okay, so hello. My name is Julia Totzen. I uh, work in the field of human resources and mediation. I'm a mediator and I'm a colleague of Ganesh Tiwari at the uh, Fresenius Hochschule. And I'm just starting my education at the university. So I'm very much interested in the digital learning field. And I'm very pleased to take part in your session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lydia. Anna Besant. Um, yeah, good morning. Sorry, my camera is misbehaving. So I apologize for that. Can't join you with a picture. Um, uh, I'm here as part of the part partnership uh, representing ISPIM. And I guess I'm I was so happy and proud that uh, from a SPIM teaching and coaching SIG were the one who were um, originally initiating this project uh, with the query to understand where the future of teaching and coaching innovation is going. Uh, so I guess that would be from my side and I pass mm -hmm. over to someone else. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Anna. Yasmin, it's a pleasure to have you here. 
Hi, um, good morning, Yasmin. I'm um, a program manager at Hochschulform Digitalisierung, um, which is a think and do tank um, where we work very closely with stakeholders from higher education institutions, um, uh, policymakers, and um, stakeholders from yeah, society, um, civil society, and um, yeah, to, to shape the digital turn um, in higher education. And I've been involved in the Vision Project as interview partner. So I was very curious to hear um, what, uh, yeah, um, to hear about the results and reflect on it is in this group this morning. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks. Uh, yes, thanks, Yasmi. Uh, Vat Sleiman. But are you there? Maybe we move on to Jane. Hi, I'm Jane. Sorry, my video is not working at the moment, um, but I'm still here. Um, I'm an assistant professor of technology management at Yonsei University in Korea. Um, and I'm interested in learning more about this um, higher education um in innovation with you thank you very much kevin yeah excuse me um for my missing video i'm right now a little bit sick um yeah my name is kevin i'm um from the digital change maker initiative from the um, hochschul forum digitalisierung where i take part in the vision a um, vision working group where we discuss about um, actual topics in higher education and bring the discussion to the students or to the universities to take a broader participation from um, all of Germany. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much. Yes, thank you and all the best for your, for your help. Jonk. Oh, okay. Hello, I'm from, uh, I'm sorry on the video. I'm from the South Korea and I'm working uh, KJSN group as a, a chief academic officer. And I'm interested in uh, technology impact. So I'm very curious about this project. So uh, it's very happy to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Then Julia, Julia Panton. Hello, I'm Julia, PhD student at um, the Tim Institute at Hamburg University of Technology. And yeah, when the colleagues sent around information about this event, I signed up out of curiosity, so excited to learn about your research. Thanks, Julia. Barbara. Barbara, we can't hear you if you were trying to say something. Yes, can you hear me now? Yeah, now. Still, still struggling with the equipment. Um, I'm, I'm a professor in Moscow, School of Management in Russia, in Moscow. And I'm interested in uh, getting more conceptual understanding because during the pandemic, we have been rushing with the money of our founders to buy broadcasting facilities and a glass room with digital tools. And we have been very successful and everyone loves it, but I need to get more systematic understanding how this can be long-term integrated and not just ad hoc. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Melissa. Are you around, Melissa? Okay, and then we'll move on to Monique. Would you like to introduce yourself briefly? Okay, it, it looks as if uh, there is some issue with the communication. Then let's move on. Thank you very much for the introductions, and I'm really glad to see so many people from so many different uh, parts of the world to be present here. And um, I will say a few things about the vision project to introduce it. 
if there is something from my uh, from the side of my colleagues, from, from my team members, um, from the project team, please feel free to add or add something, or if I have forgotten some, about something, then please you know, feel free to, to comment. What we plan, to, or what I plan to do is in my part, before we move on to the guest speakers, to introduce the vision project to you briefly, then to talk about emerging disruptions for institutions of higher education. Then I'll talk about some key insights from the vision project and what challenges and opportunities emerge out of them for higher education institutions. And uh, I will proceed with, with the project. Our project officially is called Envisioning the Future of Teaching and Coaching for Creativity, Innovation and Entrepreneurship. The project has uh, a duration from January 2020 to December 2021. So as Anna was saying, we are nearing the end of this project. It has been a wonderful experience for me to, to learn a lot from the colleagues, but also from the many research interviews that we have done. And uh, quite a few of you are also present here today. This is a special, um, special thing for me because it shows that you are also interested in, in those insights. The Vision Project has 14 partners from across Europe. And in fact, RMIT University also from Australia. There are universities like the University Amini or TUHH or um, ESADE in, uh, in Spain. We have business enterprises. We have network and associations like ISPIM. And Perceptos is here, also larger companies like Tufnord and Lufthansa Systems, publishers like Tigruiter. So it's a, it's, it's a consortium bringing together different stakeholders. It's a future-oriented and result-driven project. So we have tried to enter into an active engagement with global stakeholders and experts across higher education. And to, to, keep, to keep it short, you see here four strategic areas where we were um, tasked with and we set ourselves the target of co-creating visions. It was about the social impact and relevance, in, about Industry 4.0 and future of work, about digital transformation and about emergent topics and methods. And at TUHH, we were more concerned with the digital transformation, but basically we were all involved in all fields. Where does uh, the motivation come from for this project? And one of the motivations can be seen in the challenges and opportunities of artificial intelligence. As was uh, said in the media some years back, the risk is that the education system will be churning out humans who are no more than second-rate second rate computers. So if the focus of education continues to be on transferring explicit knowledge, across the generations, we will be in trouble because many jobs might get automated. There is a social challenge to it. But on, on the other hand, it can also free people to pursue more interesting careers. And for that, what we actually need to do, and that's the challenge, that is about building skills that artificial intelligence cannot emulate, such as teamwork, leadership, listening, staying positive, managing people, managing crisis, managing conflicts. In short, we can say all the skills that are related to creativity, innovation, or entrepreneurship, they are going to be crucially relevant for our society in the years to come. And based on this, like this is the key motivation, we tried to identify certain issues, certain research gaps that emerge, that emerges. So societal trends, we live in a world where we see rapid technological change. Technologies are getting obsolete very fast. So there, as a result of that, but also independent of it, because maybe we are having also globalization, we live in a global world, there are new ways of working and doing businesses. And there is a skill mismatch. And finally, we also live in an aging society where we have a, an increasing share of senior citizens in the workforce. And there is a need for lifelong learning. We need to, to make sure that people can learn 
and earn new competencies, new skills, so that they are able to contribute to their own personal life, but also to the society in ways that are maybe creative, innovative, fostering you know, um, entrepreneurship and, and creating a feeling of well-being for, for themselves. So the research gap that this project addresses is twofold. What knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values will be required to thrive in the future world? And second, how can education systems develop and transmit these knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values effectively? So this is broadly the field in which we have worked with the objective of co-creating forward-looking knowledge and the role of education for promoting CIE, that's the acronym we use for creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurship, to develop user-friendly and practical resources to support educators and make future-oriented recommendations for the design of policy programs and initiatives for teaching and training CIE. So this is the field in which we have been working. The project has been uh, progressing well, and we are currently in the phase of um, partly here, testing and validating vision resources and materials. We have advanced quite well. And to share knowledge and spread the results. So this is where we have uh, reached now. And now come to come back to, the, to some of the issues. What are the disruptions that the institutions of higher education are confronted with today? So here, one example, you see here a report from January 2020, so a rather recent one from MIT Sloan Management Review, Education Disrupted. Because there are skill gaps and because our institutions of higher education, our universities are unable to deliver those skills to, to those who need them at the moment, so because of that, companies have stopped waiting for institutions of higher education to impart those skills. They are going for, for their own ways, for their own solutions, so that they can address this research. So there is one challenge which comes up. What are we doing as institutions of higher education? Are we able to match the skills required, the demand for skills, for new skills and competencies that is there in the market today and probably tomorrow and the day after, what needs to be done? And maybe there are also opportunities. Second, the second disruption you see here, for instance, from Google, but Google is just one example. Google has announced some new career certificates that can be completed in six months. And they will treat these certificates which require no prior experience of undergraduate credentials as the equivalent of four-year degrees by their hiring managers. And we can imagine Google has a large ecosystem. If Google is accepting those certificates as being equivalent to bachelor degrees, then it poses a certain challenge to institutions of higher education. And it also poses a challenge actually, or a question rather to the society how much education is education in the sense of building a personality, creating knowledge, and how much is the component which is required for having certain skills, certain competencies to, fill, to fulfill certain jobs, certain tasks, so that people can have employment. So these are challenges that our institutions of higher education face as much as also the society faces them. And you see here the challenge is uh, you do a $300 course and after, afterwards, because of the degree of the certificate being recognized as being equivalent to a bachelor's degree, you can be earning in the US, for instance, close to $100,000 a year. So, so what does this mean to our universities? And here maybe again, a, a, an almost crazy example, but you see here during the lockdown, a lady in India did 350 courses in three months, making a new world record. She was doing uh, sitting at her home without leaving her home in Chennai in Southern, southern India. She managed to do courses in, um, in the US, in Denmark, in Australia, all at the same time, without leaving her four walls, without having the need to be physically present in any of the institutions. She could be attending classes, doing courses at many different locations simultaneously. So these are disruptions that we are faced with today. And it's now up to us 
to, to learn what to do with them, whether we can see it as an opportunity or it's a big challenge or it's both and then we need to master them. So what do we do? And for this, in this project, we were doing a lot of things. We were doing need analysis based on desk, desk research. We did more than 130 expert interviews across the project and we did at least eight validation workshops and uh, quite a few more in the format of like today's workshop so that we have been able to generate, I would say, a lot of input and a lot of validation effort has gone into it over the last 18 or 20 months. And I will now come to five key narratives that we have identified as emerging in, in this project. The first one is about immersive learning. So learning becomes more of an immersive experimental experience. It takes place in more creative spaces. It focuses more on the big challenges and is supported by new tech. And the impact of learning within the real world is prioritized and amplified. So we use artificial intelligence, virtual reality, et cetera. So those tools are coming in to allow an immer immersive learning. And you see here with each of these five narratives, a, an illustrative quote, for instance, here from uh, Piero Formica, who says, the future of teaching innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship is in the reimagined school. It triggers a process that puts imagination before knowledge. We should be able to um, maybe gamify, maybe we need to, to develop uh, more imagination in order to have creativity or entrepreneurship, Devel develop awareness, learning of new concepts, and to bring together humanistic and scientific sources, both of them. The second key trend that we identified is that the student is being put at the center. So it's uh, the student and not the system who is at the center. So learning can be and has to be redesigned. Better personalized, unbundled learning anytime, anywhere education, personalized learning, that becomes very critical. And here again, an illustrative quote from Dr. Tina Larvesh, who was CEO at the Northern Institute of Technology Management at that time. She said, learning will be increasingly individual. And at the same time, creative processes will be increasingly collaborative. So this means that learners will request different modules and learning units from different education providers and combine them individually to complete a degree in the course of their lives. So you can see that um, there is a certain challenge for institutions of higher education. We have a trend which where we do not have any more, uh, at least no more that significantly that a student goes to a particular university, remains there for four or five years, does his or her courses all at the same place and leaves uh, the university afterwards. So there is a challenge by, um, or due to the trend that we have the student at the center. Learning at work. So job, uh, on the job education will become critically important because as I said, we live in a world where technologies are getting obsolete very fast, new technologies emerge so that uh, we need lifelong learning. And here again, an illustrative quote, everyone is going to have multiple careers and jobs within those careers will morph at an increasing pace. So having the resilience and ingenuity to adapt will be an important attribute to develop over a lifetime. And we as institutions of higher education need to build individual capacity to meet downstream opportunities and challenges. Um, re reinventing the role of teachers. Teachers do not need to be sources of the content. They become more flexible, they act as coaches and mentors, and increasingly support the development of both hard and soft skills. And here we see a, a statement from Professor Ekman, who said, uh, my three dreams are to inspire and engage every single student, to help them to find their passion, and educate them to understand, respect, and trust other experts. So again, we are moving away from the classic role of a, of a teacher. And finally, there is a systemic shift. We need to make the universities as, um, 
and responsive to these changes because many universities, universities traditionally have worked the way they have worked for past 50, 60 years or longer. So for instance, if, uh, if there is someone at our own university, for instance, if the student wants to, to attend a course, but the student is not sitting in Hamburg, then the student cannot get registered because that's an, a formal requirement, not just by the university, but that's what the legal procedure is. So we need to create an ecosystem of lifelong learning, and learning, and redesign learning spaces to facilitate collaborative learning. Different types of challenges will come. And we have seen, for instance, in Singapore, where they have introduced a new concept that the student gets registered or enrolled, <clears throat> not just for four or five years, but directly for 20 years and goes on doing different things even after he, he or she has completed his bachelor's or, or master's. So these were the four or the five emerging narratives that we have identified in our vision project. And the core themes for today's discussion are, how can institutions of higher education turn disruptive challenges into promising opportunities? How can the requisite competencies for creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurship be imparted to those that need it the most effectively and then efficiently. And third, how can we make sure that we can achieve the dream of affordable excellence so that this education about uh, CIE can be really imparted to everyone where we can reduce the societal and the digital divide. So these are the questions and I will illustrate them with a few points before I hand over the floor to, to our guest speakers today. One challenge is lower the barriers to education. The education should be accessible for everyone irrespective of the people's location, age and formal background as was said by in one of the interviews by one of the key influencers in our project, Florian Fiedler. So, we need to make sure that we are actually able to invite those people who need the education and skills. Second, we'll need technology like blockchain so that we can have open trusted networks that enable collaboration that can create a field of trust where you can be sure about the authenticity of the certificates given by various institutions around the world. And finally, we need affordable excellence. Digital transformation will act as a key catalyst to ensure affordable excellence in education, providing access to cutting edge knowledge and skills at very affordable costs and foster inclusion. And we have seen the example of Google, the Google Academy, there are many such cases. So I think these are the challenges which we need to master, we need to find ways to, and this is why we are here. So I look forward to the insights by our guest speakers today. And uh, we'll be listening to Professor Miller afterwards from Professor Chinchule and uh, from Ms. Dagan. But before that, if there are any questions, uh, I would be happy to take your questions and thank you very much for, for listening to me today. Okay, so any questions or comments? Okay. And uh, is there anything from the team side which someone would like to maybe add to? Okay, it doesn't seem to be the case, then I would say thank you very much for listening. And may I now invite Hendrik to share the innovative teaching format, the mixed mode at Hope Schule for Seniors. Yes, of course, Raj. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. And I will also um, share my screen with you to give you. Oh, no, I, I'm not able to. So. Oh, it should be. <laughs> I thought you should be. Um... Oh, no. is it, I think because your screen is still open. That's, that's why. Yeah. Ah, OK. OK, no, I think now it should be possible. Um, Good. Okay, I hope you can see the uh, see my screen now, and I I would like to to give a sh very short introduction into the 
uh, study format of the mixed mode that um, the Hochschule Fresenius has just very recently implemented. Um, and well, you have to know that before that, we had, of course, very traditional part-time bachelor degree programs uh, in presence. And, and those will be replaced step-by-step step by this new format called the mixed mode. We have started um, at the beginning of this winter semester with three uh, bachelor degree programs, business administration, um, communication management, and business psychology. And uh, students were able to enroll uh, either in the first or second semester in, in accordance with uh, the overall 48-month study plan of these degree programs. Um, the, the mixed mode teaching format has been also accepted um, by the, on the one end of course, by, by our very own university committee um, and also the, the Hessian Ministry of Education because you, you have to know that the Hochschule Fresenius um, originally belongs to um, to Hesse. Um, so this is the, the third study format alongside uh, the traditional presence and distance learning programs we have. What are the uh, peculiarities of this new format? Um, so the, the modules of this, of the mixed mode degree program are offered both as presence modules and on the other hand as online only modules. And an attendance model consists of uh, one at one uh, time hours of guided self study, and we have six time hours of webinars. Uh, so this is the opportunity to meet the uh, the lecturer um, for the students, and uh, we have eighteen time hours of physical attendance. And, and these um, blocks of physical attendance are made up of fourteen hours of, of seminar teaching and four hours of contact time. So the seminar is to be conducted primarily with um, participant-centered teaching methods, and the rest of the time can be used for networking, for uh, breaks, or um, 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 a free exchange between students and, and the lecturer. Um, so these are, this is the form of the attendance modules, and the, the online modules, um, of course, are uh, have even a longer um, time span of guided self-study, the 119 time hours, and uh, also uh, six time hours of webinars. The, what is um, important to note is that the, the mixed mode study program is decoupled from the typical semester logic so that students can enroll on a monthly basis. So not only uh, at the start of the, the winter or summer semester, but they can enroll uh, every month. Um, and, and the whole format is based on the idea of the slider or in German, the Schieberegler. So this means that the students can, without changing their, their degree program, select their very individual study format module by module. So this means they can choose between an online or presence module um, according to their uh, individual learning type and also according to the uh, amount of time uh, they have available for each module. So as you can see, um, the slider can either go to the left. So this means people are more interested in uh, completing their, their modules online or more to the right. This means they pre, uh, prefer uh, the physical attendance and, and presence uh, modules there. Um, so for example, uh, uh, if you have 25 modules, you can choose 10 online and 15 presence modules. Um, in addition, what is, and, and this is also shows that the whole idea is to put the, the students in the center of the format, uh, is that students, if they choose um, these presence modules, they can uh, also decide which of the five examination and seminar centers, which we call PSZs, which stands for Prüfungs- und Seminarzentrum in German, uh, they want to attend for this module. So they, they can either choose Hamburg, Düsseldorf, Köln, Munich, or, or Wiesbaden. And um, the lecturers at these PSZ can then view the registration lists I think 14 days in advance and see how many students have enrolled for the respective 
module. We have a, a learning platform called StudyNet uh, where this is um, possible. So, and, and according to the number of students that have enrolled for, uh, for each module, the lecturer can adapt um, her or his teaching concept and can also communicate with the students in advance uh, via this platform online. Um, on this platform, StudyNet, lecturers can also find a, a very large number of already existing learning elements uh, because all modules are, of course, already um, um, implemented in this study net uh, with learning material. But for the presence modules, they, they have to, of course, they, they can choose which um, documents that they, they might use there and have the possibility to provide these documents, for example, also to the students. The, the whole idea of the, the, the presence models is to have this, mod, mod, uh, the, this model of the inverted classroom so that students should come prepared to the presence modules. And um, it is not the idea of a traditional lecture that um, all the knowledge have been uh, or must be provided by the lecturer because um, this is not this does not make sense if you reduce the number of hours um, students um, attend in presence. So the whole um, teaching methodology um, um, can be explained like that and um, so lecturers will also receive the contents of the classroom lectures from their respective program directors. The program director is the one who is responsible for the overall online format. And then they, uh, the lecturer will conduct seminars by means of suitable lectures. But as I said, according to the inverted classroom model with a lot of case studies and exercises tailored to the content. Um, in order to pre prepare lecturers for this new format, we have also implemented a new teaching learning um, seminar called Modern Teaching and Learning, which consists of six modules. Um, and, and with this um, program, lectures can be qualified further, um, particularly for the, the mixed mode. Um, because of course, most of them are still used to the traditional presence uh, learning methods, it is an important to give them necessary skills for digital teaching uh, methods. The seminar times are also very flexible. So as I said, um, the, the presence models are more or less centered around the 40 months um, study plan. And we have developed an, an academic calendar. Um, um, and in a semester, of course, this is in inverted commas because there, there is no traditional semester anymore. Um, but we have decided to put each module in one calendar month. So this means in this very particular month, uh, students are all only able to uh, take place in one degree program and can concentrate on this one module per month. Um, if they decide to go to the attendance events, to the presence events, they can. Uh, they have to plan two evenings during the week, from Monday to Fridays, and a, and a Saturday. And and in in the um, on the weekdays, uh, the, this, the the timetable would mean they they have to reserve the the evenings between six p.m. and ten p.m. This means three at time hour seminar and one time contact time. Uh, and on Saturday, um, the whole uh, timetable um, is between eight o'clock in the morning and six o'clock in the evening, giving eight hours of uh, seminar time and two hours of contact time on on the weekend. Um, and of course, within these this time frame, work lecturers are free to choose their the seminar and contact times. Um, but it is uh, requested to start not later than nine o'clock on Saturdays, because otherwise you don't have enough time for teaching. Um, I think this is my last slide concerning the examinations because they are also planned very uh, flexible. Um, so the examinations in the mixed mode modules are created and corrected by the online lecturer. And um, for this 
um, examinations, we we have a 24-7 um, option if possible. Um, and um, there's also an exception that uh, if there are more than 50 written exams uh, to be corrected by the online lecturer, he can extend that to colleagues, external lecturers or coordinators on the peer sets. Um, the examinations normally take place on the same dates as the examinations for the honor degree program. So this means the examinations for the presence modules. So this means every five weeks at the peer sets, we have uh, the possibility to, to um, write um, or to, 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 to take an examin examination for, for module. If um, there are also modules with, with an oral examination, so this means a presentation or an assignment or with a written paper, um, this is now taken by the presence lecturer, not, not by the online lecturer. And uh, very importantly, the, these oral examinations are organized online and take place outside the regular seminar times I've just presented on the slide before. And also here, uh, if there are more than 30 written papers to be corrected by the presence lecturer, he can, or, or he or she can extend um, this task to colleagues, including external lecturers. Yes, okay, this in, in very short um, uh, moments, I've, I've, I hope I, I could have brought uh, this new format a uh, bit nearer to you and uh, I'm looking forward to, to your comments and questions later. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Hendrik, for this um, insightful presentation of the new teaching format. And I think it's a very interesting thing, which has some implications for the traditional or classic universities, for instance, the 24-7 examination model, or the, the students not having a specific semester begin or end. So um, yeah, I think, uh, are there some experiences that you made, how it has been accepted by the students so far? Well, I think you're better qualified to answer that question, Raj, because I'm, I'm, I'm not teaching in this. I'm, I'm responsible for the program, but I'm, I'm not teaching myself. But you are one of the, uh, the lecturers at, at Hamburg, so probably you can yes. say a bit on to that. Okay, well, good. Uh, um, yeah, returning the ball to me, <laughs> to my court, yes. But uh, no, like, no, no, to, 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 so looking at the sheer numbers of students that have enrolled for the mixed mode format, uh, you, I think we can say it has been a su success so far, or th though we have just started two months ago. So this means we have an enrollment in, in September and the traditional semester start uh, and second um, wave of enrollment now at the beginning of October, uh, which does also look quite good, but I think we have to wait a bit more to, to give a, um, get to, to have a clearer picture about that. Yeah, thank you, Stefan. I think you have a question. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Hendrik, thank you very much for sharing the insights with us. So um, now you're offering, for me, it sounds like full flexibility to the students, and in a way, I like it, but also from the point of view of a lecturer. So do you need additional lecturers for this? Because what about the lecturers? Uh, you know, now you have three different learning formats and mixed mode is a new one. Mm -hmm. so to me, and also from the point of view of a deputy director of an institute, so it seems to need more lecturers, don't yes, you? Definitely. Um, that's um, um, a problem. Because uh, as I said, we, we, um, so far we had this traditional um, format um, where lecturers uh, taught for a whole semester on, uh, well, uh, one evening and pro probably on the weekend. And, and, and of course we relied on external lecturers for that in the evenings. Um, and now they are confronted with the fact that, that the, the, the sheer amount of teaching is, is reduced to just one week. And, and this uh, also money-wise, this means of course a reduction. So yes, you're, you're, you're right. I think we have to um, 
we have to be uh, we, 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 we are on the lookout for, for, for a new group of lecturers there. So some of them are said uh, no problem I, I will continue my, my, my lecturing task but others um, neglect it. And so uh, yes, it's, it's true. I think it, it's, in, it's a problem um, we have to tackle there. Thank you. I think Stefan Bergman, um, you had raised your hand and then maybe Melissa. Yes, I would have a short question about the success of the program. You just said like it was a good start and you would like to wait a little bit more. But my question would be how is how's the share of students who enroll in your program? How many choose the mixed mode and how many choose the presence mode and how many only online mode? Um, well, I don't have an overall picture at the moment <laughs> valuable, but uh, let's put it like this: in these three study formats, in these three study programs, uh, Bachelor of Business Administration, Business Psychology, and Media and Communication Management, at least, uh, if we if you uh, plan to study, um, if if you plan to study part time you have no choice anymore, but you, you will be enrolled in the mixed mode program there. But quite traditionally at, at our uh, university, I think of course the number of students who enroll in the traditional presence models are, are a bit higher, I would say, but I, I can't give you an overall picture at the moment. So the, um, the, the, the department that offers the, uh, the online course is also very successful, to be honest. Thank you. Yeah. Melissa, you have a quick question. Yes. To build on the question that was already asked by Mr. Kuzma. Yes. Is it clear now? Yeah. Um, when it comes to educators, especially since is this these programs are different from the traditional ones. Right. Did, mm -hmm. Uh, did they need any training? Was there any training conducted for educators, instructors previously to launching this uh, these programs? Previously, but parallel to it, uh, as I said, I, I think I had this on one of my charts. We have um, implemented a, a seminar series for lecturers in the mixed mode, and especially those ones who are not used to digital uh, teaching. Because as I said, they, 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 most of them come from the traditional presence teaching, and 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 that's why we we said we we have to give them some kind of training, and but but they can do this parallel more or less to the start of the program. It was not a, we were, were not able to to give them um, um, a full training beforehand before the start. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hendrik. I know you have to leave by 12 o'clock, so I won't seek now more questions. And thank you very much for, for these insights. Yes, thanks again for giving me the opportunity. And of course, you, you are as able as I am to, to answer any questions on the, on the format. And if there are any, um, there are any um, comments that you want to write me, I think you can pro provide um, my email address later, Raj. Yeah, okay, yes. and I'll say goodbye and have have a good meeting until the end. Bye -bye. Thank you, Henrik. Have a nice day. And uh, with that, I would now like to to shift the focus and go to to India, from where we have Arvind Chinchuri with us, who is now uh, maybe like who who would be able to tell us something from a different country context, but also from a not not directly a university context. Arvind has, uh, has been a university professor for long and he has seen the need and opportunities for, for doing something different. And uh, about two years back, I believe Arvind, you set up the QLEAP Academy in collaboration with the universities around the world. So we look forward to your insights and your experiences, your motivation for doing so. So the floor is yours. So uh, thank you, uh, Rajneesh. Uh, it is such a pleasure and also an honor uh, to be part of this very exclusive uh, group uh, discussing about, uh, about the impact of digital transformation industry 4.0 on higher education. Uh, I did not present uh, or prepare a presentation slides, but I would like to have some kind of a conversation or a dialogue 
to share my experience. So, um, so before I come to uh, Kivleep Academy and what made me to start this uh, new venture, so let me share uh, my experience and my insights on what is happening uh, in the world and why there is a need uh, for uh, higher education or education in general uh, to uh, transform. So I just uh, you know, remember my days when I was doing PhD. Uh, it was uh, early 1990s. So I started my PhD work in physics. Uh, while I was doing research, uh, one of my um, deep interest was about the future. Uh, the future of technology, future of the world, future of economy, industry, and so on. So I was you know, reading books after books on, uh, on future and written by futurists. You know, at that time, we did not have the concept of global megatrends. So everyone will start reading the books uh, written by the futurists. And what I have seen in the last 30 years, and particularly in the last, say, 20 years, uh, there is a dramatic shift uh, in the way a world is uh, shaping. And I see there are two critical drivers or levers of this shift or a change. One is uh, the exponential technologies or digital and exponential technologies and rise of these technologies. No one had ever anticipated 20 years or 30 years back that, uh, that you know, computers, internet will be, or semiconductor will grow exponentially so no one had ever so we had certain you know ideas but never anticipated that the things or technology will grow exponentially i think the first critical driver for us to look at is the rise of these exponential technology and it continues to rise but the second most important uh, lever what i have seen in the past say particularly a decade is uh, is it goes beyond this exponential technologies. So, and, and it is about convergence of technologies. So earlier we were looking at technologies which were exponentially growing, but now what we have what we are seeing is a powerful, uh, you know, ways uh, the way technologies are converging, not the technologies within a particular domain, but between the domains. For example. You know, today uh, we are seeing convergence of information technology and operational technology. Earlier, operational technology was independent and information technology was independent, and we were applying information technology in certain way and operational technology in certain way. Here I'm talking about operational technology like, you know, physical assets, machines, and so on. Now, you know, dramatic change that we have uh, you know iot coming in and that entire integration of it I mean, ot and it or it and ot that conversation convergence led to the fourth industrial revolution and once we started looking at this convergence of information technology and operational technology the next big thing that happened was the rapid uh, development in biotechnology now we are talking about convergence of information technology, operational technology, and biotechnology. And this has a tremendous impact on everything that we do, whether it is a work, whether it's education, or whether it is uh, industry. So what is the consequence of this, consequence of exponential technologies and convergence of technologies is that now, you know, as your you know, study identifies is that machines are becoming intelligent than humans, increasingly becoming intelligent than humans. And we have, we, have, we have started seeing that machines can now understand humans better than humans themselves. There's a beautiful work of Professor Yuval Harari. He says that machines know humans better than humans themselves. So this is something which is a, which is a you know, un, it, it, it was fiction or it was not even thought uh, off, uh, you know, 10 years back. And this possibility is because of the development of biotechnology and integration of all this information technology and biotechnology with AI, with data, with machine learning, all these things is changing. Now, 
what is the impact on us? So let's start with the industry. So we are saying that we are living in a fourth industrial revolution. In the fourth industrial revolution, we will see smart, connected, intelligent, autonomous, say manufacturing or factories. Now these machines and the factories will become so smart and so intelligent that perhaps we will need very few humans to work on the shop floor or anything that becomes routine will be replaced by a machine so or a set of machines. So the first thing that is going to happen is that those who have been on the shop floor and working in the manufacturing, their jobs will get displaced. And they need to be reskilled, upskilled to, to be relevant in the fourth industrial revolution. So then what does this mean for higher education? What it means, uh, Rajneesh, is that if I look at World Economic Forum and what last two years have been, uh, the, one of the points of discussion in World Economic Forum is about skilling revolution. Now, World Economic Forum has launched a massive program of skilling revolution. Now, in this program, World Economic Forum says that we need to reskill, upskill 1 billion people, working professional, in the next 10 years. 1 billion people need to be reskilled or upskilled in, in the next 30 years. And what is the impact of this? If you don't do, it will be $10 trillion impact on the, on, the, on the OECD countries alone. So we are talking about trillions of dollars. A lot of jobs will get lost, but new jobs will get created. Now, if, I, if, if, if someone asks me, what does this mean to higher education? This is the biggest opportunity for higher education to see that one third of global workforce needs reskilling. So because there are 3 billion people today working, so 1 billion people need you know, something uh, to uh, get trained so that they become relevant today and in the future. So this is the biggest opportunity. Now, if I go a little bit deeper uh, into this, so where do we start? See, if I had to see if I'm a say dean or a, or a president of the university, what is it that I will do to do to to contribute to this skilling revolution? The first is that those who have been trained and skilled in manufacturing, they need to be trained or skilled in digital or IT. So today, manufacturing professionals do not know or they are, they are so fearful about the sensors, about IT, about data and so on. So first thing we need to do is those who are working in manufacturing, how do we integrate them into the IT so that you know, things will now they, they, they become more valuable to the industry. Now, if I look at say technology experts or domain experts or IT experts, so IT experts are working only in information technology or say data, but they may not have a larger role in the industry. So IT professionals or technology professionals should learn operational technology or say tools and techniques of manufacturing. So the first thing higher education can do is bridge this gap, the gap that has been there for ages, uh, you know, this OT is separate and IT is separate and so on. I think that's the first thing, our first opportunity that exists. Now, let me come back to developing and developed world. So the fourth industrial revolution or digital transformation has a, has a bigger relevance in developed world. We can develop world, we have aging demographics, we need higher productivity per labor, Labor is very expensive, so I need extreme automation so that you know, my productivity still increases and then my economy grows. But let's look at the developing world. So let's look at the developing world like India. In India, we have labor abundance. We have 600, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a country of youth or youngsters. 65% of the you know, Indian population is young. And in the next 30 years, there will be 800 and millions or something, huge population will be working. While there are so many people, I mean, is abundance in labor, Indian industry is compelled to adopt to smart manufacturing, adopt to industry 4.0. So, so Indian industry or, or companies working here cannot say that we will not be 
adopting this because we have abundance of labor. So India has a very unique situation or countries like India has a unique situation. So we need a different model. So one of the work that I did uh, in the past, past say six, seven years and one of the program that you have witnessed, different booths has uh, witnessed is now we have started this innovation and entrepreneurship courses in the universities. It's extremely important. Now, what is the significance of this innovation and entrepreneurship program? Significance is that Earlier, students used to come to the university to get a job. You are better placed, you can place, uh, you know, you can get a job in the good. But now the shift has to be that I will become creative, innovative, perhaps start a, uh, my new venture to create more jobs. And, and this innovation entrepreneurship program has to be run very differently. It has to be purely exper experiential. So we cannot apply the principles or the systems of the existing education system for the for training these uh, you know innovators and entrepreneurs so i have designed the first program uh, which is india's first program uh, mba program and innovation entrepreneurship which has been a great success later i designed a program on how do we create high impact entrepreneurs how someone can take a challenge of a billion people and solve or use deep tech technology to scale and then recently i developed a program for undergraduate students as a minor in entrepreneurship program. So there is a series. So what I'm seeing in India is that there is a, there is a lot of focus on entrepreneurship. India is the third largest startup ecosystem in the world. And one of the ways India wants to progress is creating more and more entrepreneurs, creating more jobs for India and for the world. So this is uh, what I have uh, seen. So the last uh, point that I want to make uh, is uh, about uh, about higher education. So when we started a new program, we said it is a one-year program, but students will get an access to the university resources for five years. But I was happy to see that Singapore has extended that five years to 20 years. I think this is going to be very, very critical because all of us, we need to keep upgrading. So every year we need to, universities need to bring in mini programs, macro programs, and, and, and larger programs so that uh, the talent remains uh, relevant for the, uh, for the industry. So that is, of course, is a very, very important uh, thing uh, for, uh, for higher education to, uh, to look at. And now, uh, the last point that I want to make is how, as an individual, I need to be relevant. How do I acquire or, or what skills I need to acquire to remain uh, you know, relevant throughout my life. So I have a, a framework, which I call it HIT, HIT framework. So at the center is you know, innovation. So all of us, it doesn't matter which uh, you know, domain you are from, which discipline you are from, it doesn't matter, but we need to be creative, innovative, and entrepreneurial. So those are the skills, competencies, tools that we need to acquire. But the next important thing that we need is uh, we need to slowly start acquiring our human skills, human skills like empathy, compassion, um, you know, emotional quotient and so on to be being mindful. I think that is going to drive the creativity, drive innovation and, and so on. The rest is we need to have, irrespective of our discipline, we need to know the technology or technology as an enabler. So I think this human skills, innovation skills, and the knowledge of a technology and technology as an enabler will make us you know, suitable uh, in this uh, 21st century world. And universities need to also focus on human skills, not just about uh, the technology uh, skills. And the last, last point is that I think universities need to think about how do we, how universities can bring in this, you know, technology uh, and say philosophy together or technology and ethics together. I think these are the combinations that are going to, you know, needed for an individual to deal with say, how do I, uh, you know, build autonomous cars and so on. So I think these are some of the things which are, uh, which are required. I have more points, but I will stop here Rajneesh and, uh, and during the discussion, I can share my insights. Thanks. Thank you, Erwin. Thank you very much for these insights and not only just uh, relating it to the QLEAP Academy, but painting a broader picture. So um, 
are there any questions or comments? Look forward to maybe a few, a couple of questions or comments. Okay, and Stefan. Robin, thank you very much for your insights. Um, we know India is such a huge country, so many people, I mean, especially, and we know that there's only limited access to the very good universities, IITs and so forth. Um, would you agree that especially India needs new forms of learning? So online modules, all that, even much more than other countries, uh, because you have to educate such a large number of young people what do you say? I fully agree, uh, Stefan. Uh, India need to invest in building human capital because without human capital, uh, things are not going to be, uh, you know, good for India or India's progress or India's uh, prosperity. Uh, so uh, I see now that uh, that slowly uh, universities are trying to be more uh, digital uh, or, or bringing digital technologies or digital courses. Uh, so we have this Government of India's initiative called Swayam. Swayam is a platform where uh, professors like you and me can create a course and, and put it uh, in Swayam uh, platform. And there is a process of learning uh, certification and so on. I think this is something which is uh, happening. But still, uh, you know, all of us, we know that digital education has its own challenges, you know, the stickiness and, 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 and we have to make it more experiential what Rajinish founded, uh, you know, during his uh, thing. The second thing I have seen, uh, which is very, very interesting, Stefan, is that today the companies are saying, do I really need a certificate or, or a graduate from an IIT? So now there are certain intermediaries or intermediary organizations who are helping industry to get a, a good talent. Now, what this intermediary organization or startups are doing is they take the students and actually say, I'm just giving, trying to make it very simple to understand is, so they will be part of a hackathon. Now in this hackathon process, uh, what they will see is whether that particular student uh, has set of skills or not. And once uh, you know they spot those skills uh, during this program, they have different interventions. And then companies will say that, okay, here is a person who is a skilled, so why not we hire? So this is the second uh, uh, thing. The third, uh, which is a very, very recent phenomena, very recent phenomena is edtech. You may not believe, uh, Stefan, that uh, in the last say seven or eight months, we had tens of uh, you know, companies got converted into unicorns. They became billion dollar companies. And very recently, if I look at last unicorns, they're all a tech, a grad, an academy. An academy is a very, very interesting thing. Anyone who has the skill can come on that platform and you know, teach that skills. So, so now a tech has become a very, very important uh, space uh, in India, uh, which is going to disrupt or possibly disrupt. For example, Upgrad is now a multi-billion dollar uh, company. Uh, so, and their whole focus is about uh, uh, skills and higher education in the areas that industry needs. Now, industry is part of these edtech companies. Uh, say, as you give, uh, gave an example of Google, now, now Google and many other companies, they're part of this. So this Upgrad will skill and, and, and those skill will get absorbed into this uh, thing. So I think these are the three major trends that are uh, happening uh, uh, in India. Slow, Thank you, steady. Thank you, yeah. Arvind. Thank you. Thank you, Arvind. Uh, before going for another question, I would say maybe we now go to, to Luisa because you provided a perfect transition by talking about EdTech and about the challenges that are there from a student perspective. And I think uh, Louise is perfectly positioned for that because she, uh, she completed her studies just about a year back, I believe. Then she worked for an ed tech creative company. Then uh, she is now at our institute taking care of master students. So she has been able to generate many insights and we really appreciate listening to you, Louise. The floor is yours. 
Thank you very much. I prepared some slides and today uh, I'm going to try out Keynote the first time. So not PowerPoint, but Keynote. So bear with me if it's uh, not working properly. Um, are you able to see my screen, my proper screen? Yes, yes, please. Yes, I am, yes. Okay. Okay, perfect. Okay, so um, hi everyone. My name is Luisa and I'm, as Raj already said, a research associate and doctoral student at the Institute for Technology and Innovation Management here at Hamburg University of Technology. And I'm really interested in the topic of learning in general. And because of my experience in practice and in the educational setting, I will give a short presentation today focusing on the topic of blended learning, as you can see here. But before I talk about what blended learning is, and I think that- Luis, sorry oh. to interrupt you, you're actually showing the uh, presenter screen. Ah, okay, that is, uh, then I'll check again. Oh, are you, yeah, you were still with me. Okay. But it then. was interesting. Ah, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's the most important thing here. <laughs> So that's a good point because I've not tried out Keynote so far um, for presentations and I have, uh, I'll, I, will try, I will try again. So um, new shape, ah, now it should be working. Okay, great. Oh. Ah, perfect, now you can see everything. Um, does it work now? Yeah. Yeah, blended learning I see now, yes. Perfect, <laughs> so uh, let's, take a step back and uh, talk about what learning is. And um, because we talked about it so much today, I thought it would be good to bring a short definition uh, to rethink maybe what we heard today as well. So learning can be understood as the ability to act differently, compromising the three dimensions of knowing, doing, and understanding. And it involves overall a change which causes or enables the individual um, to do things differently. So in order to learn or when you have learned, you're doing things differently on basis of what you know. And the definition even goes further and says people may know cognitive, cognitively, but if their actions do not change, they have not learned. So learning can be seen as a process in which people create a new reality by talking and doing as they learn. Um, and I think this gives us quite a good overview and also a quite a good of understanding of what we talked about today. Um, it's not about only consuming a lecture, for example, but it's more about really um, understanding what is happening there and then acting according to it. And when we not, now talk about blended learning, um, we see that blended learning can be described as the thoughtful integration of classroom face-to-face -face learning with experiences with online learning experiences. And for blended learning, the best delivery methodologies available for a specific objective are used. And I think we've seen that um, also in uh, Henrik's presentation today, that it's always a combination of different learning formats. It's a combination of online and, uh, and classroom instructions and assignments, for example, of synchronous and asynchronous learning. So when we talk about that people learn on the train by themselves or that they come together, is it online or in person actually, as well as learning experiences that consist of formal and informal learning, which means that formal learning, um, you are aware of that you're learning, while informal learning is more about that you are, for example, in a specific um, situation where somebody explains something to you, and there you learn. And um, as we've seen today, it's quite, of course, on the one side, uh, time consuming, expensive, really tricky to combine all these different um, topics of um, of the or our challenges of blended learning. And for this, I brought a framework, uh, which you can see here. So um, this is the very abstract blended learning framework that shows you um, that there is a foundation um, which consists of the technology, which needs to be appropriate, accessible, and supportable. And um, there is also the aspect of design so that the learners need to be engaged. And what usually happens, uh, for example, here at TUHH, we work with Stud IP. Um, some universities also work, for example, with a learning platform called Moodle. And there you can show um, the learners um, 
what the, what the classes are going to be about. You will upload material and all of that. And this is called a learning management system. And this needs to be designed in a way that it's usable, stimulating, and intellectually challenging and interactive. Um, however, one very important aspect is of course the people in the system. And um, we heard also today that there are quite a lot of new roles and challenges that come with um, implementing blended learning approaches or switching completely to digital learning because you of course need the participants who are highly engaged, but you as an educator needs to need to be the knowledge expert who gives support whenever the people have questions. It may be that they sit on a train ride home, look at a video that you presented, and they have a very um, fundamental question which they can't find an answer to. So you, you need to be there for them and help them, even if they're in an asynchronous learning format at the moment, for example. And then, of course, there's the technical support. And I think um, everybody who worked with a learning management system knows that it's not always super easy to um, answer all the technical questions. Sometimes we've also seen today the video is not working. Something is not working. Probably you want to present your presentation, but it's, as you've seen also with me, it's not always easy. You work with new tools and you need help there. So it's very, very time consuming. And um, what Hendrik also said in his presentation, it costs quite a lot of uh, money because we somehow need to rethink everything we've done. And this brings me also to my experience, um, which I want to talk to you about, um, about today. And this consists of an experience in practice where I wrote my master thesis with a small creative consultancy in Berlin. Um, and they offer workshops, especially for entrepreneurs, which they're really excited about. However, what they experienced is that they repeat the same workshop again and again. So they offer it to this company, the next day to another company, and they constantly repeat it. And in practice, you see that it's quite challenging. It's, it's not actually value creating because you're not really... Um, in a sense, working on something new, you can't spend that time on something else. And if you're just a company of three people, this is very, very challenging and time consuming. And for them, um, what they did then is what they asked me to write my master thesis about back then was to think about how they could implement blended learning in their offers. So what I did is I looked at what other companies are doing. There are quite a lot of online um, online educators right now. There are some other companies who follow a similar approach of blended learning, and I analyzed what they did. And uh, what I found also, of course, in, in theory was that it's actually, there is a quite easy approach, for example, to restructure your workshop in a sense, that you could say, okay, usually we have a one-day workshop, but we're, what we're going to do now is we're going to divide this workshop and split it up in different phases. So it could look like, for example, here, that you have a very short kickoff and then you have self-organized learning where you provide videos or um, where you do quizzes or um, different learning formats and then you do in-classroom training again for example one to four days or in, in this case it wouldn't make a sense because it's just a very short workshop but where you come together again to talk about what have you learned and build up on that and then um, in the theory, they also talk, of course, about the transfer tasks that, as we've seen in the um, description of what learning is, that we need to act differently. So you need to transfer what you've learned into practice. Um, and I think this process, first glance, looks very nice and uh, it's manageable. And we also experienced that here, and I'm going to talk about that in just a second at the Institute that you, it looks quite easy, but what you actually need to think about as a company um, or also as a university is that you need to restructure the whole system of um, your online education or your blended learning education. So um, you need to think about how to integrate uh, learning formats in classroom, individual learning formats, synchronous, asynchronous learning formats. Um, think about what makes sense to put in videos, what um, topics you should talk about in person, um, and how to engage people along that way. 
And then you need to think about how to structure this course. And you've seen that there. But you also need to think about how can we engage people in our learning management system? And what kind of technology do we actually want to use? What makes sense? And in the end, as we've also seen, um, is to think about the support. So how can we provide perfect support along the way? And we heard today that that quite can also be very, very challenging because you um, as an educator have a lot of roles now and there are also quite a lot of new roles where you might not have thought of in the beginning that you need to support them also from the technology perspective. And this brings me to my second example which I brought here today um, here at the university. Um, last semester, I restructured together with my colleague who was uh, here in this call as well today, Stefan Bergmann and Professor Herstadt, a class called um, Innovation Management. And what we did because of uh, COVID, we had to shift everything online, of course, uh, and I think everybody experienced that. But what went even further was that we thought, okay, this gives us a chance to um, apply what I've learned, for example, previously, and just try it out in a sense. So we developed um, short videos on foundational topics. So in general, what is innovation, for example, and we provided that to students. Then we did um, in lecture or proper lectures, of course, via Zoom because we couldn't meet in person. And we did quizzes um, and short discussions on the video content the students saw before. And then we went on with the actual lecture um, that included case studies and online simulations in classes. And this was more about that we um, said, okay, the short videos are more the foundational topics and the lectures should really focus more on more um, tricky, topics, for example, so more where we actually need to talk about. And this repeated, I think, for around a month. So we broke the lecture into different pieces um, and the students had to watch videos, come into class, do a quiz. And then we had an another lecture with case studies and online simulations. And what we wanted to do then was okay, say, OK, we want to help students even better to transform what they've learned into practice and we developed a simulation game uh, in class where they students had to act as employees of a company called Moshio um, and they had to implement a campaign called digital and sustainable and um, what they did there is or what they try to do there is to apply what they've learned in practice and for us, this was a quite a good experience, um, but more or less also an experiment because we've never done something um, or restructured a lecture before in, in that way. But what we also saw was that it was quite challenging for the student to grasp so much of what was going on. So we had, for example, these short videos, then we had the lectures, the simulation, the case studies, and all of that again and again. Um, and at some stage, or especially in the end, we had the feeling we lost them a little bit because they were so much in the simulation that they didn't really think about anymore um, of what they learned the month before. Um, so the key learnings I derived from this and looking back, um, from all of this um, experience, yeah, <laughs> would be that there are exciting opportunities to integrate new learning formats in class and in practice. Um, however, each learning experience is so unique and requires unique learning concept and settings, which means that you really need to take the time to think about what should my class be about, what should, um, what makes sense to teach online um, and asynchronous, what do we need to talk about, how could we integrate what has been learned online into the actual classes. So it takes so much time and effort that you really need to take a step back. And in that sense, what we also did in, in the seminar or in the lecture here at the university was that we said, okay, we're going to just take risk and experiment. So we asked the students for feedback and asked them 
um, how we could develop this class further because the feedback, as you could imagine, wasn't that great because for them it was much too uh, complex. And this also brings me to the last point, which was don't make it too complicated. And I think this also um, brings us back to the topic of um, vision the project. Also adopt a frugal mindset. So don't make it too complicated complicated for the learners help them to really uh, understand what you're doing and don't make it too great don't implement too different um, or too much methods and learning formats and styles and um, don't overload them in the end because in the end it's all about supporting people to do things differently and this is what you're there for as an educator you're not just there to provide knowledge but to help them transform that knowledge um, and help them act differently in this ever-changing crazy world. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Luisa, for this uh, perfect summary. The, the summarizing statement connected very well to our entire team and with also with this frugal mindset. So thank you very much. And uh, now if there are some quick questions or comments, Please feel free to do so. Barbara, yes, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes. yes. It works, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, thank you, Luis. I think it's very um, uh, insightful to get a hands-on, very personal experience. And your last statement reminded me a lot about our own experience. We try to put the same content we had in uh, offline classes into the different formats. And we found out that it's just not possible. We have to cut down we have to reduce content or we have to extend the period uh, because maybe the reflection individually uh, by the learners and we have mainly executive, uh, senior executives who are 40 plus in EMBA program and in corporate training, they, they, they were um, actually missing the classroom and the interaction with peers and so they had to digest all of this on their own and that means they, they just needed more time and give them less complexity is certainly something you said but i wanted to get your views is it a generational problem or do we have similar observation also with younger people like bachelor or junior master students because if that is the case the hybrid format would certainly help a lot because there we can use the in class or in person uh, parts maybe in order to help with the reflection, digestions, and, and changing it into behavioral um, improvements or changes. So that, that was my question to, to Luis and maybe to the colleagues around in this, in this group. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. Um, so from my experience, I would say, um, if it's a generation topic, I would, I think it's it's always very tricky to engage students also online, and I think we experience that ourselves. That we, um, if we are online in a in a talk or something else, then an email comes in, and you suddenly get lost, uh, and it's really difficult to concentrate. So I think the combination between online and offline is very valuable. Um, but I also see that, for example, when we look back at um, the Fresenius example, it's more about how you can apply the knowledge in the end. And if you have, for example, a master's or, or bachelor's program completely online, but then you are able to apply that knowledge directly, um, that that is quite useful. But I would say, from our experience, we, they always say, oh, it would be so nice to meet everyone in person, to get back into classroom together. And uh, our cohort, I think they, uh, for, for the master's program here at the Institute called um, G-Time, which Stefan Buse also uh, briefly mentioned in the beginning, um, we experienced that they started very shortly in person and then had a year of only online classes. And it was very, very difficult for them. Um, and the group dynamics were, quite complex. So probably mixing this up and using blended learning would make sense to um, make learning much more fun and engage people along the way. But I'm also not sure if, I mean, that's only my experience. I don't know if anybody else would like to add something. Thanks, Luis. Um, Luis, I think I agree with what you said. So there's no 
nothing to add from my side, but I would say if in this group there is a, a, an urge or a need for discussion, actually very much encourage to, to, to take this discourse further. If there are any points that you would like to discuss with us, the, the entire project team is at your disposal. We are happy to, to listen to your comments or questions even after this session. So please feel free to, to get back to us if there's anything. Um, are there any urgent questions that you would like to address to, to Louise right now or to, to Avind? No, okay. If not, then I would like to, to say that um, we can be completing now, but before I do that, th just a quick um, question to my team, follow team colleagues. Is there anything that you would like to add before I finish? By the way, like we would be coming up with this publication that Steve mentioned, there would be a book in open access where you would see all our results and this book can be accessible to all of you. So please keep following us and uh, see at our project website, LinkedIn, Twitter, there would be updates. And uh, Anna, is there anything you would like to add before we conclude for the day? No, I first of all want to thank you, Rajneesh, for and for all speakers. It was really interesting uh, listening to all of you. And thank you for all participants that really uh, participate and uh, listen take a part of this workshop. Yes, thank you very much also from my side once more to all speakers and to all participants. Would be happy to hear from you in this regard if there's anything and have a nice day.